Welcome, Welcome to another edition, edition, a special edition, edition of Anglican, Anglican Unscripted, episode 489. I'm Kevin, Kevin Coulson. And I'm Stephen Nall, and today is February 15th, Friday. Three, two, one. Now, I'm not that good at math, but if I do my math, we're like 11 away from 500. Oh my gosh, it's a lot of episodes. So I have on the program Stephen No, who I've had many times. He does great interviews. Um, he's kind of my insider guy with GAFCON and uh, all the uh, declarations and statements that go in and out. And he does a lot of international work for GAFCON, um, helping keep um, a lot of people on the same page. Very difficult to do. I and I don't envy your job at all. Now, oftentimes, you're referred to, at least in places I know, as the architect of the First Jerusalem Declaration. And I wanted to talk to you about that, because if it's not true, I think we need to clear that up. Well, thanks, uh, Kevin. Well, it's your colleague, uh, George uh, Conger, who keeps saying that I am the writer or author of uh, the Jerusalem Statement and Declaration from 2008. Uh, no, I was on the statement group. I had input. I had my finger in the pie, but I did not write it, uh, nor did I write the uh, letter to the churches from 2018. But I think one of my callings has been to, to explain the, the, the text of these two important documents, as well as uh, the prior uh, resolution from Lambeth 1998 on human sexuality. I think that's my gift is trying to look at texts, look at what people say, and then try to make sense of them. Well, well I have you on the program this afternoon, afternoon to talk, talk about a couple of things. things. One, One is, is for the last, last what is it, almost a dozen, dozen years, years now, there's, there's been boycotts to different um, level events, events, whether it's been primates meetings, meetings whether it's been Lambeth, um, and other things that have gone around the communion. And now there's discussion again within GAFCON of whether or not they should attend Lambeth 2020 because the ACNA, ACNA, is not invited. And George, and sometimes I think that you should go and show up uh, because at times you could you know, retake the microphone, hopefully retake the agenda. But then I remember the primates gathering back in uh, England in January of, what, two and a half, three years ago, where everything went right. You got the communion uh, primates to agree to sanctions against the Episcopal Church. All you had did was, hey, Justin, would you take care of this for us? And he said, I got you covered. I'll take care of it. The Episcopal Church is not going to be anywhere in leadership for three years. And, and so, so going, going and getting your way and having, having the right votes and having the microphone and the right, right agenda doesn't work either. That's right. Well, I mean, I've been hearing this uh, saying about let's all get together and go to Lambeth or to the primates meeting and we'll take a stand. I've been hearing that for 20 years. Mm -hmm. And the fact is there were two occasions where that was fairly successful. One was in 1998, when the Global South got together and produced Lambeth Resolution uh, 110. Uh, the second one was in 2007, when the primates met in Dar es Salaam and came out with a strong statement uh, calling for the discipline of the Episcopal Church. Those were the two successful um, points at which the Global South stood up. But neither of them actually resulted in any, uh, any fruit because the Episcopal Church um, basically thumbed its nose at Lambeth uh, 110 and the Archbishop of Canterbury ignored uh, the resolution in 1997. All the other meetings have been largely run and manipulated by the communion apparatus uh, in, in England. So when people say, let's go and stand again and this time we'll win, well, we Americans know, you know, about Lucy and the football and Ch Charlie Brown, and that's been pretty much our experience, you know, time after time after time. Uh, so that was why in the uh, letter to the churches this past June, the uh, GAFCON assembly voted uh, to ask two questions of Canterbury, 
One was that he invite those bishops who had upheld Lambeth Resolution 110, and two, that he not invite those bishops who had openly violated uh, that resolution unless they repented. And the letter went on to say, failing to receive assurances about this, we urge our members not to go to the Lambeth Conference in 2020. So that's what GAFCON said, and now we're having this little game playing out between uh, Canterbury and you know all the people who he's wooing uh, to come in 2020. Well, the, the office of Canterbury, Canterbury visually is strong. is strong. I mean, he, he can, can offer the English kingdom. kingdom. You know, you know tea, with tea with the Queen at Lambeth, Lambeth that was what they offered uh, in uh, 2008. Uh, there's, uh, there's a lot that goes with attending Lambeth. Lambeth. For some of our uh, brothers and sisters, sisters it's a, their first health checkup in a long time. time. For, For some, some, it's, you know, other things, things that are offered at this conference that they don't get. get. Plus, Plus, if I'm not mistaken, it's a free ticket. Uh, that's what I understand, at least largely so. Yeah, so, so yep, it's, it's hard, hard to compete with that, with that to, to say, say, you know, well, well actually, actually, you did compete. GAFCON did compete with Lambeth, and, and they won. won. More, More people were willing to pay to go to GAFCON in Jerusalem than go to, to Lambeth in uh, 2020 uh, for free. I mean, so you can compete with that with uh, uh, certain structures. However, it's easy for Justin Welby to woo people. Yes, having said that, there also have been significant, uh, if you wish, boycotts of Lambeth. In 2008, of course, there were over 200 bishops who did not attend Lambeth at all, and of course there were about 280 who did attend uh, the Jerusalem Conference. And already uh, this year, uh, if I'm correct, three provinces, uh, Nigeria, Uganda, and Rwanda, have announced that they will not be coming en masse. So right there you have over 300 bishops who have said they won't be coming to the uh, Lambeth Conference. And I think there are many more who are, are maybe weighing the pros and cons of this. And that's one reason why I, I and others have been trying to make the case that this is not a helpful event, not a healthy event for uh, Orthodox believing bishops to attend. As, As always, always, right before Irby Lambeth, Lambeth, a year or two before, people, people start offering solutions. Uh, I'm seeing solutions from Ephraim Radner. Listen, if we just do these things, we're, we're back in, in communion again. Things will be working uh, high and fine. Um, all you need is to do is these six things. And I'm seeing these letters and promoted ideas from other places on the Internet. And I kind of want to talk to you about that because... Even if Ethan Rander got all six of his ideas passed by Justin Welby and the leadership of Lambeth uh, and all the primates, I doubt they would be enforced. Right. Well, let me just speak a little bit about how that came to be. I think the, mm -hmm. in a way, the seminal event that happened was about a month ago when a, a bishop, uh, Kevin Robertson, in Canada... Uh, was married to his same-sex partner by a, uh, another bishop with the primate present congratulating them on their marriage. And it suddenly became apparent that Kevin Robertson, even though he's not a diocesan, was receiving an invitation to the Lambeth Conference. And I think some uh, people, like Andrew Goddard, who's been one of the conservatives in England, suddenly realized what a crisis this would cause. Um, and I put it this way uh, in one of my pieces. I called it Taking Sweet Counsel Together. How can an Orthodox bishop from Africa or Asia or Latin America uh, sit down um, across the table at GAFCON or the Global South uh, meeting with Foley Beach, who's a full primate in each of those groups, and then go to Lambeth, where Foley Beach is not invited, neither he nor his bishops, and sit down opposite Kevin Robertson or others. And, and I've made clear, it isn't this one man, really, himself. It's the fact that 
uh, those members of his church who have elected him teach that that lifestyle is uh, is in accord with Scripture, that God blesses it. So it isn't it's just a matter of Absolutely. problem with yeah. It's the same thing with Gene Roberts, uh, Gene Robinson, uh, you know, 15 years ago. Yes, he was a he was a, a photo op to be sure, but it was it was uh, you know Frank Griswold and all the bishops who had approved him, who as, as far as I'm concerned, were complicit in that uh, way of life. So, so I've been reading your blog, blog the last, the last couple of days, days, and uh, you, you have had discussions with uh, Bishop Sumner uh, uh, from uh, uh, Fort Worth. Uh, and uh, Dallas. Not, not Fort Worth. Dallas. Dallas. <laughs> okay. Audience, Audience, it's 341 Friday, Friday afternoon. afternoon. You're, You're lucky, lucky I even have a smile on. It's just time, time to go. go. And, and I, I want to thank Stephen for showing up this late in the afternoon on Friday. This is what you're going to get. So Dallas, he's the bishop of on behalf of Jack Eicher, the Bishop of Dallas, I absolve you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so, so, Bishop so Sumner. Not the Bishop of Dallas, uh, the Bishop of Fort Worth. I, I absolve myself. Just, I'm doing well. So, but, but you're, you're used, used to this. this. You, you watch, watch the show. You, you know that Kevin uh, doesn't always communicate exactly what he's thinking or the problem is he is. So, so tell me about these communications that have been going on with uh, the bishop. Yeah. Well, uh, again, I might say that I have not been very directly involved in the affairs of the Episcopal Church uh, over the last 20 years, um, even though I was ordained and been a priest in the Episcopal Church for 37 years before leaving in 2008. But I was out of the country. I was in Uganda when a lot of these events happened. And I have felt that the issues regarding the so-called communion partners, the Orthodox who stayed in tech and the ACNA are really not my area of involvement. Uh, I, each one, they have their problems, we have ours in ACNA. But because uh, George Sumner is a member of the Lambeth design team, and because he propounded this idea of good, uh, of impaired communion as a way of sort of uh, finding a middle way to stay in the communion and go to Lambeth, I felt that I should uh, expound what he said and in some ways, ask how that is consistent with what Bishop uh, Bill Love of Albany has said, who simply refused to uh, accede to the resolution from the, the General Convention uh, last summer, the BO12, it's called, I think. Mm -hmm. So I, I did sort of exegete that and really asked uh, Bishop Sumner in what way he says he is in full communion with uh, all the bishops of the Episcopal Church, and that all the members of his diocese are in full communion with all the members of the Episcopal Church. So I asked the question, what, what does it mean to be impaired? Um, and he said, yeah, that's a problem. It's impaired. <laughs> uh, I, to my mind, koinonia, or communion, is one of the most precious uh, spiritual gifts given to us by the Holy Spirit. And uh, Throughout history and throughout Scripture, there are examples where people have uh, had a, a situation of broken communion over matters of uh, fundamental truth, including fundamental moral truth. And so I challenged um, uh, Bishop Sumner to try to uh, uh, explain further, and he did reply, and um, I appreciated that, um, but I wasn't satisfied. But I think the second thing that's come out uh, just more recently is a, a pay, uh, um, an article by uh, Ephraim Radner, who has also been one of the spokesmen of the Communion Partners, um, calling for a radical uh, revision of the design of Lambeth 2020. And that, I thought, was a much more, well, positive proposal from my point of view the question, as you have rightly raised, is, will it go anywhere? And um, so, if you wish, I could say a little bit more about what he said and then the problems that it caused. Yeah, yeah please. please. Okay. Well, the first thing that he says, um, I'm going to read a little bit here, is he has six resolutions for the redesigned Lambeth Conference. 
I will say this. He seems to have an idea of what I would call Lambeth 1 and Lambeth 2. So there will be a general uh, jamboree of anybody who wants to use the name Anglican, and that could include you know, the, the far, far left, the far right, everybody in between. Uh, that's an idea I think that Rowan Williams had thrown out there some years ago. But the real question is, which Lambeth, Lambeth 1 or 2 is the one that actually has authority, that actually speaks for the church? And I think that's Lambeth 2 is where he gets down to drawing some, uh, some lines, rightly so. So his first um, uh, resolution is uh, that uh, this conference reaffirms the 1998 Resolution 110. Now, my response is, hallelujah, the Global South has been asking for this for 20 years. Um, in fact, it's been part of, it was part of the uh, uh, Jerusalem Statement in 2008. It's been part of the Global South Anglican uh, statements over the years. And in fact, it's really at the heart of these two questions that, that Gafcon asked of Canterbury. Are you prepared to invite those bishops who've upheld Lambeth 110, and not invite those who have rejected it. So Lambeth 110 is a hugely important theological statement. You know, the Lambeth Conference has been meeting for, you know, since 1867, and frankly, a lot of them are, are fairly dated, and very seldom have they actually addressed what we would call substantive issues of the faith, things which uh, we would call essential, things which are taught by the Bible and, and denounced by the Bible. Well, Lambeth 110 was one of those statements. It made a statement about the nature of marriage uh, in God's design and singleness or abstinence. And it uh, said that it could not, uh, that, that uh, homosexual practice was in contradiction to Scripture. And it followed with a number of resolutions on the authority of Scripture. So this was a hugely important statement that was made in 1998. And as you know, it was very highly contested at the time. But it did pass by a fairly large majority. And, and that's, the, that's, that's uh, when, when it came, came to the table, table a, lot a lot of people, people that we didn't, didn't think would raise their hands, hands said, yeah. said, okay, okay. Yeah. That, was that was surprising. surprising. So anyway, yeah, so, so Ephraim Radner is saying that this conference reaffirms Lambeth Resolution uh, 110. And I said, this would be a huge step forward. Um, so I'm, I'm kind of taking his proposal um, charitably, like this is a real possibility. Uh, so then we come to his second, his second resolution says, uh, those bishops and churches who contradict or contravene this affirmation, 110, or who punish others on the basis of such an affirmation, should stand aside the boundaries of Anglican teaching and witness as this conference understands it. Well, who are these people that he's talking about? I mean, this is uh, the Episcopal Church, the Anglican Church of Canada, the Episcopal Church of Brazil, and, and now some more. Okay, okay. Hold, hold on, on. there's all more. Church, Church yeah. of England. Well, they haven't officially yet, but... Okay, okay. well, we keep, we keep saying, saying that. that. Well, well, we're not changing, changing our prayer, prayer book. book. Uh, um, the God, God that I know isn't, isn't looking for what's on paper. paper. He's, He's looking for what I do. I do, yeah. I I do what, what I believe. I believe, I believe what, as, as shown by what I do. Well, you're right. And, uh, you know, I, I wrote some articles just before I left for Uganda about has the Episcopal Church officially renounced its own formularies? And, you know, there, were a couple, there was a resolution in, in uh, 2000 that was, you know, depended how you wanted to read it. There is something to be said for the official formularies, whether it's the prayer book or the canons or whatever. But there's also the spirit, the culture of a church, and certainly seems like the culture of the Church of England, with some very prominent exceptions, is moving in the same direction as the Episcopal Church. But anyway, this is the, the group that uh, Ephraim Radner says should stand aside. And I'm saying, again, uh, once again, this would be a huge step forward um, and, in a sense, backward, because that's what the Global South has been asking for 20 years. Yeah, uh, yeah, we go, go all, all the way back, back to Tanzania. Tanzania. Yeah, you know, yeah, or, yeah, or to uh, Kuala, Lump Kuala Lumpur, uh, even sure. before that. Yeah, Ronald so, Williams was sent, sent to the House of Bishops in Louisiana, Louisiana seeking a repentance. A repentance. Yeah. So 
again, uh, that seems to me to be a, a very important uh, resolution. Um, and, and then he goes on with a number of others, uh, one of which is, I think, also important. He says, we recognize, this is number four, we recognize the missionary and pastoral integrity of the Anglican Church of North America uh, and its related member churches. And we urge serious deliberation locally and at the international level over how these churches can be integrated into the life of the communion. Now, I pointed out on several occasions that the, that the primates, that is the communion primates meeting in October 2017, explicitly said that the Anglican Church in North America was not only not a member of the Anglican Communion, it was not Anglican. We were just Christian brothers. Go and be warm, they said. So, once and again... Conceptually uh, Anglican. Yes. yes. Yeah. So, I think this is, you know, again, a very uh, creative, positive proposal that Radner is making. Um, and it doesn't exactly say that the ACNA should be seated at the table, but um, that certainly would be an implication going down the way. Uh, I want to mention again, I've been talking about this, this book uh, for years called To Mend the Net. Uh, you may remember back in 2001, two archbishops, uh, Drexel Gomez and Morris Sinclair, proposed a, a very cautious, careful uh, uh, series of uh, disciplinary actions which might lead ultimately to a province or a church being, if you wish, excommunicated and a replacement church being uh, recognized. Well, it seems to me that that's in a way what Ephraim Radner is proposing here, that uh, if, obviously, if the Episcopal Church and others change their views, and repented, then that's another matter. But if they don't, then they would be excluded from the communion uh, councils. And at some point, you have to have someone who does represent Anglicanism in North America. That would be the ACNA. So these are all, needless to say, these are proposals that some of us have been making for many years. But the fact that he, who has really stood up um, you know, to defend Canterbury, uh, is proposing these suggests that there's some real concern that things are falling apart and that Lambeth Conference may be a huge disaster. So I, well, I, I want to credit him for that. And I, the other I, thing I said, yeah, go ahead. Well, I, he, he did a great job. But once again, we notice that even in the past, when things are passed, they are not enforced. Well, right. And, and what one of the things that I said in my response to him was, that his resolutions would only be acceptable and workable if they are um, if they're established at the beginning, before the conference ever you know even begins. Mm -hmm. It isn't something you're going to debate at Canterbury 2020. We've seen that before, you know, and and that's going nowhere. But I did point out, and this is the this is the uh, uh, the way the con communion uh, conservatives argue if. The Archbishop of Canterbury actually has the so-called inviting authority to decide who comes and who doesn't. He could choose to adopt these six resolutions ahead of time, announce it ahead of time, and then let the chips fall. So to that extent, you could say Ephraim Radner has sort of tossed a, um, a proposal in the lap of Justin Welby. And I even had a very specific way that this could be brought to Justin Welby, and that's through Bishop George Sumner. Now, you know, I think that uh, George Sumner and Ephraim Radner are close friends, colleagues. They both, you know, were in Toronto. I don't know. I don't even know what diocese Sumner's from. Yeah, well, I know. know. Okay, some of you. Anyway, <laughs> I actually, I, I know them both from the past. We worked together in the late, in the 90s, when we were mm -hmm. trying to stop the juggernaut. Um, anyway, George Sumner is on the design team for Lambeth 2020. So I said, look, this is urgent. If anything like this were going to happen, it would be a major shaking of the whole edifice of the Anglican uh, communion apparatus. If it's ever going to happen, I think it needs to get to, to Welby very quickly, and the person to do that would be George Sumner. He is on the design team. So in, in a way, what I think Ephraim Radner is saying, we need a redesign. Let's start over again 
working from first principles rather than yeah. this elaborate uh, uh, indaba uh, process that you're working on. It looks to me so far that Lambda 2020 is going to be indaba 2.0 from well, the, the stuff that's across my desk. And yeah. that's going to be very disappointing because what do you think the communion is going to look like in another 10 years if we don't have a successful Lambeth? Well, um, I, I would say it's going to look something like GAFCON, maybe GAFCON plus Global South together. That's what it's going to look like. In fact, that's I, probably already what it is. I mean, I, yeah, I, I, is it, go ahead. As I've said before, GAFCON has the leadership in their hands now yeah. they're having trouble with some communications inner communications and stuff like that i don't think they realize what they have yeah. well yeah. i mean you know i i've always said and and gafcon said from the beginning we recognize and honor the historical roots of the church of england its missionary uh uh, you know, strength in sending out people, and the reason we have an Anglican communion is because the missionaries followed the the empire and established these strong churches. And all of us love Anglicanism. We love the hymns. We love the cathedrals. You know, and that's the sad part. That it is. At some point, you have to make a choice between the people truth. Ask me, Kevin. Why are you an Anglican? And I always say I'm an Anglican because Anglicanism is form and function. We have the liturgy. We have so much of, you know, the tradition and uh, the majesty. And we get to worship yeah. the, on the same page around the world every Sunday. Yeah. You know? And Well, I, um, <sighs> Kevin, I, I'm convinced that, uh, that Ephraim Radner's proposal won't go anywhere because it, it seems to me that uh, Justin Welby and the communion bureaucracy up there has made quite clear where they're going this you know living in faith and love is is going to be the agenda of the conference and it's it's going to be a a babble of you know on the one hand and on the other this context that context but here's the good thing if in fact this well what gafcon wanted to do by giving these two questions to canterbury was to get him to declare himself in a way, I think Ephraim Radner is doing the same thing. Declare yourself. Now, his overall, you know, uh, MO has been to avoid declaring himself on anything important. Uh, and so I'm skeptical that, that uh, Ephraim Radner will even get a response. But the fact is, he's a well-known, uh, thoughtful uh, Anglican theologian. He's been very supportive of uh, Canterbury and the communion. He's stayed within, uh, you know, tech and ACOC. So if you're not going to listen to me and obviously, or to, <laughs> or to Nicholas Oko or, or, you know, the other 40 million uh, Anglicans out there appealing to you, at least you could listen to one of your own, uh, own people. Sure. Absolutely. All right. We have butt up against like 30 minutes, which is fun. It's a lot of fun talking to you. I get, I get all my secrets from you, but don't, I'm not going to tell anybody, okay? All right. Yeah. So well, that's the end you. of our Friday. What's that? Yeah, I just say thank you. And if anybody wants to follow me, I'm, I'm blogging on contendinganglican.org. I'll put the link in the show notes. I'm Kevin Coulson. And I'm Stephen Dahl. And today is Friday, the 15th of February, 2019.